Um, the field we talk about is anthrocomplexity. I, I coined that phrase some time ago to distinguish complexity in human systems from complexity in termites' nests and bird flocking. Uh, we're starting to call that computational complexity, right? Um, and it's important to understand because intelligence, empathy, a whole body of things add so many layers of additional complexity to human systems that you can't use simple agent-based models. Yeah, the, the exercise you just did is actually an example of an agent-based system. Um, it's predator-prey, all right? So basically, that, that exercise was derived from antelope behavior. So the way that antelope protect themselves is by actually bunching together. By protecting another antelope from the predator, the overall thing is safe. If you look after yourself individually, then the herd splits. Right, now, that's an example of something which you can do agent-based modeling. Birds fly around in the sky, fly to the center of the flock, match speed, avoid collision. Yeah, add another rule about leadership swapping in a time interval, you get the V shape that geese form in the sky. So one of the ways we get self-organization in nature is genetically encoded rules responding to chemical traces. Human beings make decisions based on patterns, not on rules. They have multiple identities. There are so many additional factors we have to think about it. And probably one of the most critical ones is actually narrative. Now, this is from Alistair McIntyre, a British philosopher. Uh, like me, he studied them McCabe at Blackfriars. And this is actually quite important. Deprive children of stories and you leave them unscripted, anxious stutterers in their actions as in their words. Now, that picture on the right could be my grandmother. She was the last in our family to speak Welsh as a native. At the turn of the last century, the English decided we should be educated, which is quite generous of them, really. Um, but it had to be in English because Welsh was a primitive language holding us back. So if my grandmother was caught speaking Welsh in primary school, she had one of those wooden badges hung around her. It stands for Welsh not. Yeah? She then had to catch one of her friends speaking Welsh, at which point she could hand over the knot and whoever wore the knot at the end of the day got thrashed by the teacher. Right? Now, if I tell that story in Canada or Australia to indigenous people, we sit down and we swap notes. But the attempt to eliminate people's language and culture is an attempt to destroy their identity. And the same applies in organizations. If you try and force people into a corporate narrative, you're actually doing the equivalent of that. You're destroying their ability, their identity. Doesn't mean you can't mi mutate it, migrate it, influence it, but you can't define it. Now, key to that is to allow people, and this is the principle we developed a long time ago, to allow people to interpret their own story. Because the real power in narrative isn't to tell the story, it's who interprets the story which counts. Yeah? And also, you can't do that in an explicit way. So let me take the standard example. Um, you've all, well, Two or three things. Um, you've all filled out a, a net promoter score question at some time. You know the ones? It's, it's an example of how Goodhart's law is broken. So we, they identified in a famous Stanford paper that if you ask people one question, would you recommend our product to other people? It was the best predictor of success. So it's a good measurement. But then, as Goodhart famously said, any statistical instrument used for policy loses all value. Or as Marilyn Strathen translated it, the minute a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a measure. Everybody then got targeted on it, and now every questionnaire you get has that on it, and you know exactly what they want to hear. Yes, I remember when I was in IBM, the same was true in engagement surveys. We got this question, does your manager consult you on a regular basis? Scale of zero, not at all, 10 all the time. That's called a hypothesis-based question. And you know what answer they want to hear. Yeah, so if you're in a good mood, you say 10. If you're in a bad mood, you say zero. If you're statistically literate, you make it eight or two because you know they eliminate outliers. I just give you that as a tip. All right, but the point is you gift or you gain. Okay. And I remember phoning up at the MHR, and as you rather gathered from my Myers-Briggs experiment, I, I was on a watch list, so I got straight through to corporate headquarters. All right. And I said, how am I meant to answer this? You're answering a question which assumes a context-free world in a context-specific situation, which was a bit cruel because she said, what do you mean by that? So 
but that was deliberate, to be honest, right? And I said, well, what happens? I've got several managers and people I take business direction from. Nobody in a modern organization has a single manager, and particularly not in IBM, right? And I said, sometimes they consult me and sometimes they don't, and sometimes they should and sometimes they shouldn't. So how do I answer this? And she said, average your experience over the year and stop making trouble, which was a mistake. N never tell a Welshman not to make trouble. It just becomes an irresistible challenge. Over the next 18 months, we actually had algorithms which actually told people how to fill out the employment engagement survey. We got about two thirds of the staff to do it in global services. And we conducted controlled experiments to see if we could modify the behavior of HR by modifying the input into the engagement survey, and then we show the statistics of what we've done, and for some reason she was irritated by that as well, but never mind, right? Never upset techie, yeah, we had fun on that one, right? But the point is, you, the answer is meaningless because people gift or game. So we take a different approach. First of all, we want a non-hypothesis question. Yeah, so the normal one is, what story would you tell your best friend if they were offered a job in your workplace? Yeah, another really good one we've used a lot is you're a grandparent and your grandchild says they're going to follow your career. What story will you tell them? That's actually really effective because you gather those seminal stories, the stories that really define culture. Because culture is defined by the micro narratives of the water cooler, not stories told in workshops. Yeah? We're now using cartoons in that you literally choose a cartoon which represents the culture, tell a story of why you've chosen it, and then go on from that. And that actually gets more engagement. It takes some of the pressure off. And it gives you really valuable data. Cartoons are effective at that. We use gaping void ones. What we then do is we allow people to index it themselves. And so, for example, we would give people a triangle. Sorry. See the color we see. A triangle which says the manager behave the manager was altruistic, assertive, analytical. That's three positive qualities. And the principle of triad construction is three positive qualities or three negative qualities. And so actually the respondent doesn't know what the right answer is. Now we've actually wired people up to see what happens on this. There's, there's fun in being a psychology department visiting professor. You can get the students and do experiments and they can't stop you, right? Well, there are some limits, but there aren't many, all right? Yeah, particularly in the modern age. Um, what that does, a cognitive load does, is it takes you from what Cardamon called thinking fast to thinking slow. Yeah, or in real science, it's from autonomic to novelty receptive processing. So a different part of the brain comes into gear and you go to more deep underlying attitudinal beliefs. It's also quite interesting in trading off three qualities, you find what's really important to people. Yeah, in terms of the way it works. So somebody will place their story here and of course that tells us something about it. And typically you'll have six triangles. Yeah? One of the things we're also now doing on the health ones is we create a canvas which goes high empathy, low empathy, against low pain, high pain. If you don't know it, pain and empathy are intimately linked. And then the patient literally places three markers on that to say, this is how I see it, this is how I think the nurse sees it, this is how I think the doctor sees it. And we've done that in organizations. You know, we take the corporate values, we put them on scales, this is how I see it, this is how I think senior management see it, this is how I think my management see it. You're gaining that perspective and you're giving people the power of interpretation. So you're making them agents in the process rather than just actual research subjects. Yeah. Now it's probably easier just to show you that. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah, because I can, re I can, I can actually reorientate the triangle each time so you never see it in the same sequence. Yeah, whereas with a triangle I can do that, I can't do it with a square. The other reason is actually triangles work for humans. It's actually a well-known fact, all right? If three pin princes are sent on the quest, you know the third prince will always satisfy it. Yeah, we, we, we find three things easy to accommodate. More than three becomes difficult. Yeah, yeah two is too simple. Um, it's actually an organizational change strategy as well, by the way. We, we send out trios rather than pairs. 
You know, if you go out for dinner with strangers, two strangers is a difficult meal. Three strangers, it's much easier to handle it. So actually getting three people from different backgrounds and throwing them at problems is a complex systems intervention technique. Yeah, you know, if I send 15 trios out to look at a problem for a day, I get better data than if I get a consultancy team in for a week. Yeah, because I've got micro diversity and total diversity in it. Right? So this is an example of a leadership journey one. This is actually with um, a major company. Um, what we do here is, and just to be clear, all of SenseMaker is designed to be set up quickly and run. Once you've run it, we rebrand it and put it into your operational systems. Yeah, at which point you get the GUIs and everything like that. The idea at the moment is fast prototyping, see what works, then you make it operational. But the key thing is people can tell a story or they can take a photograph or use an existing photograph. So I warned you about this, all right? Um, this was where I went walking early in the morning and didn't pay attention on the top of Triven, all right? Do not do a swallow dive at 3,000 feet on a rocky mountain. I then walked down a 1,000 feet and thought I'd just take a picture before I wash my face in the tarn and then realized I was going to have to go into hospital, right? The trouble is, I then thought of the irresistible tweet to go with this, which is Red Dawn on Triven, which kept me going for the 1,000 feet down to the car, and I really shouldn't have driven into hospital, but I was wanted to send out that tweet, and the family never forgave me because that was the first they found out, all right? So I can take a picture, I can record a, record a story, which is important in a lot of our work in Africa, where it's illiterate, yeah? And basically, it's the combination of that which I'm going to save as a narrative. Now, and that's actually quite important. The nurse can take a picture, write something, record a patient. You allow multimedia input. We don't allow video because people construct stories rather than recounting anecdotes. Yeah. Um, then they can give it a name. That's actually quite significant. And by the way, this is really important in medical research because up to this point, the patient can withhold the data, but they share the metadata. And that's a big breakthrough in narrative research in medicine and social work because the ethics around the original narrative is deeply problematic where you've got to interpret it. But because they interpret it, they can withhold the narrative on a permission basis because you're really interested in the interpretation. And by the way, this is a quant approach. That also helps with 360 feedback um, as well. So the name, then often the title is more significant than the story. Yeah, in terms of the way people describe things. And then you can see the triangles. Yeah. Now, it's actually quite fast, but it also allows me to then look at the data. So if I look at this, and I won't show you the IKEA one, there's some really good stuff in that. Um, this is one we just did. This is a medical one. So you can say in this story, decisions were made by gut insect, logical thinking, something outside of our control. I can now say, well, I'm interested in kind of like, these were sort of a combination of all of those. So what does it say? Right Now, I haven't prepared this. I'm just looking at this at random. And I can say, well, actually, these things are interesting out of our control. Yeah, what's actually going on here? and you start to see these very prosaic stories. Now, I've given this to executives, and I've seen them spend hours every night going through the stuff. It's called disintermediation, because they no longer have interpretive layers between the raw narrative of their employees and the abstract layer, and that's actually important. Yeah. So I've got that direct thing. The other good thing about this kind of like stuff here, so let's take another one. This is related to what I'm going to finish off on. This was actually using children across Libya after the revolution to capture stories from adults. We've done a lot of this, and this is now a worldwide program. Using children as ethnographers to their own community is much more successful than sending in consultants, and you can scale in large numbers. In Pakistan, we pulled in 50,000 micro-narratives in four days. Yeah, by actually training schools through school teachers to capture stories at a low cost with real-time data. Yeah, and it gives you much more valuable data in terms of the way it works. So as you can see here, and I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow, but I'll mention this now. This is called a vector theory of change. 
a vector theory of change. I'll go more into this tomorrow. Out object, Outcome-based objects don't work for a complex system. Remember, in a complex system, it's a direction of travel. That's a vector. What I now say is what I actually want is fewer stories like these and more stories like those. And that really simple phrase, few, more like this, fewer like that, can engage people at the right level of abstraction and they can come up with concrete small changes which can make a difference. Now we did a big one in Mexico, we had children outside the churches on the weekend. I mean, this is a Catholic country. And they were asking, what are the stories that Mary of Guadalupe would say to the people of Mexico today? If anybody here is a Catholic, you know the Blessed Virgin only ever appears to actually issue you know, dire warnings of doom and dire prognostication if you don't reform. Uh, the only time she didn't do it is when she appeared at Bondi Beach and nobody was listening, so we just know she appeared, all right, in that sense. But that's Australians for you. Um, what that then allows us to do is to map the stories and go into a school and say, what could you do tomorrow to create more stories like this and fewer stories like that? without once mentioning drug barons. Yeah, because you're going to what anthropologists call the ideation pattern, the underlying pattern of people's beliefs and likes. And I also showed that because actually I can use any language. And this is really important. I'm talking about this yesterday with City of Melma. If you've got people from multiple immigrant communities, they need to be able to tell the story in their own language. And all you've got to do is translate the signifier labels so because you're only going to look at the stories if they're relevant to a statistical pattern. This is quant in a qual domain. And actually quant scales, because numbers are objective, stories are explanations, put the two together, you're in a much more powerful pace yeah, in terms of the way it works. That's the physicist in me speaking. Right? So coming back to this, that also allows me to do some quite interesting things. So remember we talked about outlier identification? This is where we've presented an infographic representing a current problem. We just did this on North Korea, well we did it a year ago, uh, when there was considerable concern about North Korea because of the danger of actually land invasion preceded by neutron bombs was one of the most realistic scenarios. And neutron bombs scare the living daylights out of anybody who knows about them because they're a genocide device. They destroy everybody. Every living thing gets destroyed, but in two days, the radioactive decay is such you can go in and occupy. Yeah, it's kind of like it's the ultimate, you know, the old, old things about let's do carpet bombing. Yeah, this kind of like actually will do it. It will just kill everybody. Yeah. So what we did is we produced an infographic working with the BBC, yeah, like a news item, front page of a newspaper. We presented that to literally, you know, BBC foreign correspondents, foresight specialists, people in five government departments from North Korea, gave them six triangles based on what we know about foresight and strategy and asked them all to interpret at the same one hour period into those triangles. And that allowed us to draw the maps. And these are two of them. Yeah, this is clustering an awful lot of stories. And this is called a fitness landscape in biology. Yeah, in fact, the axes come from the triad labels, but you can't game it. So you can't input is not traceable to output. And that's really important in targeting. With a conventional questionnaire and targets, you can trace input to output so it gets gamed. But what you see here is that we've got a dominant view here, but we've got two outliers. Remember the gorilla? 17%. And immediately seeing the people who are seeing the problem differently. So what we do in organizations now is once people are used to it, a chief executive officer can literally pulse out an infographic to their entire workforce, get a response back and look for the patterns in the response. Yeah, we can also generate scenarios, which we did in this case. So for example, using the Olympics, becomes an outlier. You can see the same pattern here. This one, by the way, is more worrying because I haven't got any outliers. This is actually quite confined. One of the things we're now using this for is to put out a, actually a quite sophisticated infographic, get everybody in the workforce to employ it, and then measure cognitive diversity in the workforce. 
Yeah? If we got this on that pattern, that would be really worrying because it means the perspective of the organization is quite narrow, so they're not going to see outliers. The last thing you want, this really upsets a lot of organization change people, the last thing you want is everybody aligned and thinking the same. That was one of the major mistakes of Peter Senge learning organization. Yeah, the last thing you want is to homogenize the workforce. You need heterogeneity. You need variety within the system. You need multiple compatible goals, not single goals. So that kind of like illustrates that. This then is used in peace and reconciliation or in merger and acquisition. And to be honest, merger and acquisition is rather similar to peace and reconciliation in what's it's involved. Yeah? So what we've done here is actually to present an infographic about the future state. We then distribute it to a large civilian population and got them all to interpret it. And then we're color coded by different groups. In this case, blue was ex-military, green was ex-guerrilla movement. Right? Now, as you can see, there's no point in getting blue and green to sit down together. Yeah, and this is actually really upsets a lot of consultants who like facilitation because they have this white, you know, middle class liberal belief. If I just get everybody in a room and I talk to them enough, yeah, then they'll c become like me. All right. I mean, that's the problem with a lot of facilitation. It's kind of like neo-colonial in its nature. This basically says there's no point in getting them to talk to each other. You might think that the red guys in the middle are kind of like actually a good idea, but they're not when you look at the underlying stories, because remember I can click on it and look at the stories, you discover they both hate these guys. Yeah, I mean they're trying to be fish not fowl, all right, sitting on the fence. The strategy we did here is to actually say, how do I create more like this and fewer like those, more like this, fewer like those. What we're trying to do is to make the extreme so extreme that most people don't want to be part of it, and we get a new group in the middle. This is actually really powerful during reorganizations. Yeah, because you can present an infographic to everybody in both the merger or the acquisition, everybody interprets it, and you can find where you've got overlap, which might be age, length of service function. Those are your, uh, your low-hanging fruit to get started. But you're mapping, remember the complexity principle? You're mapping the territory before you decide what to do because you're finding what's sustainable. Okay? Right. Having done that, I want to talk through the citizen engagement side. This is actually a program we call Engage, Empower, Enact. We need to engage citizens. We need to empower them to make decisions. We need to enact their decisions. That's the principle, called EQ for short. That's actually a picture, if you don't know it, all of those girls were genetically mutilated and or raped. They're now acting as ethnographers to people at risk of the, uh, the same horror, which is actually damn sight more therapeutic than being counselled, and they're getting data that nobody's got before. You know, with the UNDP, we actually got Roma children to gather stories from Roma adults, and we got data that nobody had got before. So that's kind of like the principle. And one of the ways we handle the time issue is that we actually make this a journal. So we, US Army in Afghanistan, it shows you the diversity of the work here. We said to company commanders, you don't have to write a patrol report if you keep continuous narrative records in the field. Remember I talked about lessons learning? The data they do in real time is far more valuable than something they write at the end of the day. And I can integrate it in real time with other data and I can reduce IED yeah, improvise explosive device dangers. Yeah? So one thing you in companies, we've done this with nurses, is you don't have to write an end of shift report provided you keep your records up to date in real time. So one of the ways you handle the time problem is you take time, you give people time back from something they don't want to do and move it in that place, and that's a key principle. Yeah? And you'll see that come on the way approach here, and I'll, again, I'll talk more about this tomorrow in design thinking. We're trying to distribute the ethnography, but also distribute ideation, distribute the generation of ideas for change. Because that shouldn't be privileged. And that's really by participation. And the goal of the e cubed is to see the world through the eyes of the next generation. To use children as ethnographers worldwide. Yeah? And it's based on a series of pilot projects. We've done a lot of these now. Right? Um, that's actually a really interesting one on sports. 
Yeah, and it's an example of using it indirectly. We actually use kids playing sports to gather stories about why they did it and why other people didn't. Yeah, and actually they all wanted to do that because it was a sports club motivation, so they got people engaged. And then we found, for example, with girls playing rugby in South Wales, that they were the main agents of change in South Wales. Which, if you're South Welsh, you understand this. We, I, you know, I grew up in a matriarchy. Now, the reason I'm called David, all right, is the eldest son of the eldest daughter is called David, right? So theoretically, I'm head of the family, but I know it's the women who run it, right? And the basic order of fear is you're mildly worried about your wife, you're really worried about your daughter, yeah? Your mother is a fearsome figure, your grandmother, oh my God, and if your great-grandmother is angry with you, leave the country and only come back when you're asked, all right? I mean, in South Wales, literally, men still hand over their wage packet to their wife on a Friday and get given their beer money back because the women manage the deprivation within the community. And that's, it's gone over into monthly wage packets. It's a really strong culture. Yeah? And it was the young girls who were actually going into old people's homes and gathering stories from them because they wanted the older people to be fit too, yeah? in terms of distri distribution. So the Welsh experiment, I thought I'd show you a happier picture of a Welsh girl than the other one I showed earlier. This is the so-called Welsh national costume. Uh, if you don't know, we have a thing called the Future Generations Act in Wales. It's unique to us as a country, and by the way, we are a country. The EU has officially designated us as such. We're not a province. Yeah, basically, there's legislation passed in Wales now. You can't pass any government legislation unless it specifically takes account of the needs of the next generation. And there's a commissioner to enforce that and enforce the practice. And that's actually quite, you know, from our point, that's, that's a sort of inspirational thing that we've done, which people are starting to look at. So that was one factor. Growing concern over social media. I said 15 years ago at a conference in Washington, it was prophetic. Anything an algorithm can interpret, an algorithm will create. Yeah, social media is now the problem. In complexity terms, social media is what we call an unbuffered feedback loop. Yeah, and if you remember in the financial crisis, computers trading caused a crash. The same is true on the internet. So what we want to do is introduce a huge level of human agency into the network to act as a buffering device. Yeah. Uh, one of the drivers for it was Brexit, because it came as a shock, because actually people voted in ways nobody expected. Yeah, and people realized that the opinion polls and civil servants, and actually it was kind of like, what the hell is going on? Trump and Brexit were really useful for us yeah, because it made people realize what we've been saying for years. You're not listening to the street stories. You're listening to what people say when they know what answer you want. What you're not listening to is the street stories. Yeah, and that's what we need to get. And you know that in Sweden now as well. You've had the same level of intervention by Putin that we had in England and everything else. All right, The last election here was deeply disturbing in that respect. Um, we need to create sustainable change in de deprived communities, which actually means they've got to be able to generate their own ideas for change, but make them visible yeah, for funding. Because the trouble is governments like big initiatives, but people in deprived initiative, in private areas lead lots of small initiatives. So we've got to create a mechanism by which those can be found and funded. And that, that was another mission on this. Um, and kind of like, we need to create something which has utility for the users because these people have been surveyed to death. So we need to give them something that they find and they want. And finally, we need to look at transgenerational intervention. What we've been doing is get, we've been getting young people and saying, if you want to learn how to use a software, of course, which is an incentive. And if you become a journalist, we'll give you a certificate of competence, which is what the young people really want because it improves their employability and their college applications. You know, to say they've been a citizen journalist and they've been trained for a year is actually hugely valuable to them. Yeah? But what we did is say, if you want to be trained on this, you've got to bring somebody from your grandparents' generation to the workshops which design the interventions. Because when you get young people together, they get too idealistic and nobody listens to them. It's, oh, that's the young people. You've all seen this with youth parliaments. Yeah, and then we get these grand visionary stuff. What we want is a grandparent, not their actual grandparent, who knows the community, knows what works. That coupling produces micro-interventions which are sustainable. And it's called the grandparent syndrome in anthropology. Grandparents will tell things to grandchildren they won't tell to children and vice versa. 
The main reason is actually grandparents were the primary child carers for most of our evolutionary history. Yeah, and there's a different sort of responsibility. And that's actually been quite successful. So, that we did. We've done that now in Wales. We've done it in Colombia. And we're doing it in Singapore. The initial program there is obesity management. And what we're doing is something we also did in Ohio, which is weird because it was funded by Victoria's Secret, so I'm still recovering from that one. All right? Where we got children to go and act as journalists to investigate adult obesity. And the children changed their diet. And this actually is really important. Yeah? If you get children to act as journalists and investigators for problems, they work out why it's a problem for them without you telling them. And actually also, adults change their behavior. And I can tell you this really, if your daughter has decided you're going to lose weight, you do what you're told, right? Because you, they never let go. I speak this as having lost 35 kilograms, all right? But that's a story I'll tell you tomorrow. Yeah? Um, we're now actually scaling that up. And it was quite interesting. Malmo were interested in this. We were talking with them yesterday. So basically what we've now done is kind of like we got the core team. We're now ready to roll out over multiple cities. My ambition on this is to have every child in every school in the world acting as a journalist to their community every week. And that's actually easy to do because all schools have got a target for community engagement, statistical knowledge. So we actually create a package which is a tick in the box for the teacher. Yeah, which makes it attractive. And I've got a continuous 16-year-olds every year yeah, in that way. Yeah, and the, the program we start with, by the way, is you go into your community, you find somebody from your grandparents, your parents' generation, who you most respect, and you ask them for the story from their life they think you should remember. And that's one of the most effective ways of cultural mapping and discovering underlying attitudes and beliefs. And when we did the project in Pakistan, we proved radicalization was going from the UK to Pakistan, not the other way around. Yeah, actually through those stories. Yeah, which was not unexpected when we saw it, but rather upset the Foreign Office and rather pleased the Home Office. Yeah. Um, sports, community centers, sports clubs. Yeah. Um, and coupled with that, once you've got the data, yeah, of course, actually, people can sit down in communities and say, what can we do to create more like this and fuel like that? On the Welsh one, the government minister said, I want more like this, fuel like that. But then transgenerational pairs came up with micro-interventions to achieve it. Yeah, so you've got that sort of mass distributed engagement. Right? So I talked about this because I was asked to how you change cultural change in government. One of the ways is to radically change the interaction between government and people. This is also much better than distributed you know, participative budgeting, which all the evidence we've seen all right, actually means that it's more important to dish your competitor's project than to promote your own. If you have an explicit voting system, then killing the other guy is more important than promoting your own. With this, we can look at narrative patterns and we can actually present multiple budgetary proposals to large numbers of people and look at patterns of interpretation to make decisions in terms of the way it works. And so there's some quite powerful stuff we can do on that in terms of engagement. And kind of I'll leave you with a final message. This is a gaping void cartoon. This is one of the ones we actually use for cultural mapping because the people who picked this are different. Yeah? And I'm saying this because if we look at things like global warming and the rise of populism, yeah, one of the reasons I was in New York at the weekend is the UNDP yeah, are now going to be part of this program and back it because you've worked them for a year, and we're lo currently looking to raise capital for this and local uh, examples. But from a planetary point of view, we need that engagement network in place over the next three to four years, because we've got to discover micro-interventions to change the attitudes to climate control. It won't be changed bottom top down. That will never work. You've actually got to start to run multiple programs by which we can find out what can make climate control particular to a microgroup so that they see the importance of it. And that's kind of like where we're going. So the life is too short is kind of like a literal statement as well as everything else. And it kind of like shows a complexity point. Because I can have my government officials, I can have employees, I can have citizens all within the same system. And I can look for patterns and compatibilities. 
One of the really scary things we do is we take stories told by citizens, we cluster stories which were indexed alike, we give those to civil servants and ask them to index it the way the citizens would index it, and then we show them the difference. Now this is actually a powerful change mechanism because you're not saying you're right or wrong, you're saying you went through the process. Yeah? So they went through the same process, why is it different? And there are three responses to this, one of which, two of which are invalid. One of which, the invalid one, number one, is kind of like, oh my God, how do I interpret it the way they interpret it? Well, that's kind of like silly, you can't. The valid response is, okay, I'm different, what does that mean? Right? Because you have expertise, but it may be that you're right, that they're wrong, but you've got to explain it differently or whatever. The most scary one, which we get on two-thirds of our projects, is they don't understand their own stories, they haven't indexed them correctly. Now, and you'd be amazed how much common that is. Now, when you point out that number, nobody cannot index their own story correctly, it's that shock factor. All right? You suddenly see most people get it. Yeah? But it's the whole point is to see things from multiple perspectives. And this concept of coherent heterogeneity is a key one. You need to have enough difference that people feel they're different. Yeah? And they say, I'm going to introduce this in tomorrow when I talk about apex predator theory. If you homogenize the political system so that people don't see any difference between the main political parties, then the energy costs of an extremist group coming in left field goes down. Right? And the same applies to products. When the market becomes commoditized, that's when new products will get introduced. Right? But that's for tomorrow. Okay, so I hope that kind of like wound the complexity stuff together. Because basically in human systems, the way you understand the present is to map the micro-narratives of day-to-day -day existence and see where you can change. And it's actually deeply pragmatic and relatively easy. The theory may be profound, but the practice relates to how we live our lives. We tell stories. Any questions? They ask you far more questions than they ask me, Elenka. You're not as intimidatory, right? Okay, guys, so hand over to you. Uh